you know, looking at the room, uh, Mr. Mosley, you may think this is a small group in comparing to all the huge crowd that you used to have. But uh, this, is, this might be a small city, but our thinking and ambitions and our work ethic is not small. We do understand the importance, economic importance, of the Port of Houston. Because every time that the mayor and I and our staff receive an inbound delegations from whatever countries, we always mention the port because, because the port is the, the driving force. And especially with the expansion of Panama Canal and the completion of the widening of the Port of Houston, this will be a game changer. I can see that next year there will be a lot of cargoes will be flooded and go through the gate of, of, of the Port of Houston. And you play a very important role who is the general manager, international general manager, to coordinate all these activities. So with that, we'd like to work closely with you. Long gone is the time that you can sit here, and then people will come to your city, just like several other cities out there. Mm -hmm. You have to go out there. That's why the man courage, the man courage, with the man, encouragement and counsel, we have m made several outbound trade mission trips, mm -hmm. you know. So we'd like to work closely with you so that when things happen, don't forget Mizzou City. You always promote the Houston region. And I might be biased, but I think Mizzou City is in the heart of the Houston region. Mm -hmm. And strategically, and with all the land that we have on, nine, uh, on Highway 90 and Fort Bend, I can envision that this will be the home of several international manufacturing companies and distribution centers. With that, uh, I'd like to formally in introduce our speaker. Mr. John Mosley joined the Port of Houston Authority as a general manager of the Trade Development Department in February 2010. From 1987 to 2010, Mr. Mosley served multiple capacity in the U.S. and abroad for companies such as Mitsu OSK Lines, International Development and Energy Associates, Costco, CMA, CGM. In his position at the port, he is responsible for guiding the trade development team to increase vessel costs cargo's volume and overall commerce through Houston via Port of Houston Authority facilities. With that, would you please join me to give him a warm Missouri City welcome. Thanks, so much. Thanks, so much. Thanks so much. You know, uh, we uh, often uh, in our national trips, we're traveling around the country, we're traveling all over the city. Uh, whether it's uh, Fort Bend County or Harris or Montgomery and then even beyond, right, international trips. Uh, we do touch with, uh, we touch bases with a lot of different representatives from the Houston region that are out uh, trying to attract business for the area. And no wonder that's why this entire region, including Missouri City, <coughs> including the city of Houston, have been so successful in, in garnering the highest rates in uh, employment generation in the country, in business generation in the country. We're constantly making headlines. This region is just a vital region. And like I said, I keep bumping into people all over on my different missions. But I'll tell you, and I'm not just saying this because I'm here in this crowd, but honest to God, when I'm out there, one of the representatives that I bump into the most is Councilman Danny Nguyen. He is one of the most active active uh, international ambassadors for uh, Missouri City that I have met and uh, and I'm extremely impressed by what he has done and what he's trying to accomplish together with the mayor's vision and what you your group is trying to accomplish so for me it's a great pleasure to be here because I want to I want to make sure that whether it's a large city or a small city we're all together we're all partners in the area and if we can do anything we can in order to drive business for the general region and for Missouri City I'm all for that so uh, thank you very much for your invitation thank you for including us uh, today I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview on the uh, Port of Houston um, naturally we're 
were, were, were very well known as here, I mean the port, but uh, just to give you a little bit of background, a lot of some details you may not be uh, familiar <coughs> with, and, uh, and then I really want to just get into a little bit more of the conversation about how we can collaborate in actually driving business for Missouri City. Like you said, there's some opportunities there, and let's just, we'll get down straight to the, to the brass tacks about how we can actually drive some business and how we can kind of help each other uh, in our common goals and, ob and, and objectives. Um, next year, uh, well actually, yeah, next year, 2014, uh, we're gonna be celebrating our centennial, our 100 year anniversary. Um, early on, uh, as, as most of us uh, already know, uh, when the region was developed uh, nearly 150 years ago, uh, the founders, our forefathers for uh, the city of Houston, really set out to, on a mission to build this area into a world-class uh, metropolitan area. And in order to do so, one of the things they really wanted to do was make sure that uh, there was a viable port <coughs> here. There was a lot of intense competition between the Port of Galveston and the Port of Houston in the early days. Actually, Port of Houston was, uh, if you read some of the journals back in 1915, I've read some of the books from the early <coughs> founders of the Port of Houston. They, um, they really were, were, were reporting that the, uh, the board at the Port of Galveston were, were laughing at us, you know, what's Houston ever going to be? Uh, Houston is never going to be a viable uh, a port area, but you know, through perseverance and hard work and some of the vision, especially by the uh, local uh, business leaders, um, we stand here today with what is considered to be the largest port in the country in foreign waterborne tonnage. You know, we move more than 230 million tons of cargo every year and we are by far the largest port in the country in terms of, of waterborne tonnage. Now, there were some things that contributed to that. Um, naturally, Spindletop was, was a big uh, uh, contributor in the whole growth of the, of the oil and gas business in the energy sector. Uh, cotton in the early days was huge. Um, that was a really important uh, part of our development in the early days. But, um, but really, there was also some other things, natural disasters and calamities, which uh, were very unfortunate, and uh, we don't like to uh, you know, pronounce our success because of things like that, but um, Galveston suffered because of hurricanes and just their location so close on the shore, where an, an inland waterway, an inland port like Houston, just had that natural barrier which, which protected us. And in the long run, it, it ended up really helping the region overall to have a safe harbor um, up the Houston Ship Channel that could help the city grow and prosper. So, so we've been around almost, uh, almost 100 years. Um, basically, we were established by the state of Texas, but we're governed by uh, local, um, local uh, uh, government. Uh, we're appointed by jointly between uh, Harris County, the city of Houston, and then a group of uh, cities and communities that line the uh, Houston Ship Channel. You may have read just recently that we just uh, appointed our new chairman, uh, Chairman Janice Longoria, um, now is, uh, has been voted in to head the uh, Port of Houston Authority. Um, chairman uh, Jim Edmonds uh, decided to retire. Uh, he's been at the helm for more than 10 years and uh, he just felt it was his time to move on with some of the other activities. It is a volunteer position. It's a non-paid volunteer position and we really thanked him for his uh, great contribution and his vision throughout the years and now uh, we're very excited about our new uh, chairman, uh, Janice Longoria, who's going to be taking over. We also have a new commissioner uh, who uh, joined us as of uh, about a week ago, uh, Commissioner uh, John Kennedy. He was out of uh, Nassau Bay, uh, just a, a local community as well. Now he's going to be one of our commissioners as well after Commissioner Lanier uh, stepped down for personal reasons. But, uh, but the group is uh, privately managed. We do, we are the only public sponsor along the Houston Ship Channel. There's more than 150 different uh, entities that line the Houston Ship Channel, and, uh, and 149 plus of those are all private. We're the only public entity that's there, and what we're, done, what we're tasked with is to ensure that the waterway is safe, that it's clean, and that it's always open for commerce. 
but it's really private industry that's driving the business. Uh, more than 90% of the business is actually petroleum, is oil, liquid bulk, ener ener energy related, crossing the docks of, uh, of the Exxon Mobil terminals and the Shell terminals and the different uh, oil and gas companies that line the, the ship channel. So um, that gives you a little bit of a, of a perspective on the, uh, on the history and how we, uh, how we kind of evolved. Interesting footnote, when you, when you think about uh, commerce and international commerce, uh, one segment and one mode of transportation that's really become uh, really the, the premier way of shipping goods uh, internationally is the container. Um, the very first container ship uh, ever sailed uh, was the IDLX in 1956. And what a, little, a lot of people don't know is that actually the Port of Houston was the recipient of the world's very first ocean container that sailed from New York to uh, Houston. So we have a very long tradition, a long history of moving ocean containers in addition to non-containerized non -containerized cargo, which was uh, really the only mode to ship uh, cargo uh, before the advent of the, of the ocean container. But um, we now today have grown to a point where we dominate the U.S. Gulf Coast with nearly 70% of all containerized traffic in and out of the entire U.S. Gulf Coast. There really isn't any other um, port in the U.S. Gulf that compares to what, um, what Houston is. So it's, a, it's really one of the crown jewels, not, not just of the Houston uh, uh, metropolitan area, which includes Missouri City, but also it, it also is a crown jewel for the state and it's a national treasure because we are of vital uh, security and economic importance. Um, nearly 50% of all the plastics content uh, that, that are used in the U.S. are um, derived from goods that are produced here in the Houston area. Um, nearly 17% of all the gasoline uh, that is consumed in the United States is also produced and refined here in the Houston area. And uh, with the huge uh, petrochemical complex that we have, which is the largest in the Americas, second in the world, um, you know, naturally we're of, of, of national vital importance as well. So, so the waterway, the port, is a major um, uh, cornerstone for the, for the region and together with the Texas Medical Center um, and the uh, aerospace industry, it's considered one of the pillars of the entire region. <coughs> Actually, um, one thing that's really interesting is that uh, how the city sort of evolved uh, because of what the port was able to do um, MD Anderson actually was founded uh, by um, by Clay Anderson who was actually a cotton merchant who had uh, facilities uh, and was shipping cotton in and out of the port and with his wealth he was able to establish what is today uh, the Texas Medical Center yeah, so so it's a long history and uh, we're a large uh, economic engine uh, for the area um, a lot of this, uh, you already know, uh, strong state, strong city, our GDP, our population growth, all these things, those are really the drivers for the Port of Houston. Um, you know, it's sort of a, a symbiotic kind of relationship, you know, the, the city continues growing, business keeps coming into Missouri City and, and other communities around the Houston area, and that in turn drives demand for goods and consumer goods, which in turn drives cargo growth cargo growth through the Port of Houston, which in turn allows us to continue developing our infrastructure and growing, which in turn drives more business coming in. So, um, you know, really the, the big story is the fact that Houston and the state of Texas are really doing it and making it happen and, and, and allowing us to continue growing and, and feed into that, into that growth. Um, you know, as far as status goes, as I mentioned earlier, we are the number one port in the country in terms of uh, foreign waterborne tonnage. Um, the largest port in the country in terms of overall tonnage, which would include domestic freight and international, is the combination of all the Louisiana South ports. They do a lot of barge moves through the Mississippi River. They're a little bit down because of the, um, the water levels in the Mississippi River, but when you combine all the national and the uh, international freight, the, the, the whole range of ports in Louisiana uh, uh, combined are the largest group of ports. 
uh, the Port of Houston alone is the largest in terms of foreign waterborne tonnage. And if you were just to separate just Houston, then we would also be the overall largest. We're, um, we're the 13th largest in the world. We, we do uh, nearly 1.9 million uh, containers per year. Uh, that's what moves in and out of the uh, out of the area, and we manage more than 8,000 international vessels in and out of the Port of Houston, which really puts us on top of any other port in the country, because uh, we handle more ships than the Port of Los Angeles, Long Beach, and the Port of New York combined, uh, just with the n uh, number of vessels, 8,000 vessels. That's a lot of vessels that move in. Um, naturally, a lot of those are liquid bulk vessels. But uh, when you talk about international commerce, we do handle more vessels than any other port in the country. A lot of times when you read on the headlines about the Port of LA and Long Beach uh, being the largest port, they're referring to the container business. In terms of container business, the Port of Los Angeles is the largest port in the country, uh, handling more than 10 million containers a year. Um, port of Long Beach is the second largest port in that complex because they're really sister ports. They're right next to each other. They're adjacent uh, to one another. That's really the largest uh, container port complex in the world. But when you consider all the international freight, um, then Houston outranks everybody else. <coughs> um, one thing that we're very proud of is our role uh, locally, uh, here and regionally in the state of Texas and across the country. The activities of the Port of Houston <coughs> contribute to more than a million jobs in the state of Texas. This was a study we just conducted through a third party um, uh, uh, consultancy group uh, last year. Uh, we found that uh, we had grown uh, the number of jobs over the last uh, five years by over 167,000 jobs. We're now at uh, more than a million in the state of Texas and more than two million across the state of Texas. That's both direct and indirect jobs associated to the activities of the Port of Houston. And as far as the economic benefit, um, it's amazing that uh, we do more than, uh, well, nearly uh, 500 billion worth of economic activity uh, across the country and uh, nearly $180 billion worth of economic activity um, just in the state of Texas. So as you can see, we're a major uh, force, um, not just for the state, but also for the country. A okay. um, couple of things also that we're very proud of, and I'll just hop through these real quick. They don't really have too much to do with the business, but they, they are uh, things that are vital for us to always uh, maintain a healthy and, uh, and a long-term uh, operation. Uh, couple things is that we're the first U.S. port to achieve ISO status on security. Uh, we're also a uh, extremely green port. A lot of people don't don't know the fact that uh, Houston is usually associated with uh, a lot of heavy industry and maybe it's not so clean but honestly we are actually one of the greenest ports in the country so we're really leaders when it comes to looking at air quality water quality and being uh, a strong uh, environmental stewards and we we put in systems and we're leaders in the country in setting up uh, procedures and processes to to ensure that we're clean that we're safe that we're uh, we're really in the uh, forefront um, with those two uh, important uh, initiatives. We have, we have basically eight <coughs> ocean terminals. Six of them are for non-containerized business and two are for containerized business. Um, the two container uh, ports are Bayport and Barbers Cut. Bayport Container Terminal is actually our newest container terminal. It was opened in January of uh, 2007. It's got a full uh, design build out to handle uh, 3 million TEUs of cargo. So as I mentioned earlier, today we're handling 1.9 million TEUs of cargo. The, uh, at uh, full build out, Bayport Container Facility, uh, that complex will be able to handle 3 million uh, TEUs of cargo uh, on its own. Today it's about 50% built out. Um, it still has some more work to do, but uh, when you look at all the equipment that is located here, it's all equipment that is geared for the next generation of ships coming in, the very large ships. Um, that equipment that you see up there, those cranes, are called superposed Panamax ships. Uh, they can, I'll go into that a little bit later in another slide as far as the Panama Canal expansion goes. 
but those cranes that you see up there, those are all cranes that are outfitted to handle um, extremely large ships that are 10,000 TEU in size. And, uh, and I'll explain that to you as well, a little bit about how that relates to the Panama Canal. Yes, sir? A TEU is a 20-foot equivalent unit. When you're out on the, on the freeway or when you're driving around the Houston Ship Channel, um, often you'll see a truck that's got a container on top of it with a company name on the side of it. Usually they're long containers. Those containers are 40-foot containers. They're exactly 40 feet long. And a 20-foot equivalent unit is the unit of measure used for vessel capacity and for throughput. It's just the industry norm. Uh, they use a 20-foot equivalent unit, a TEU, as the unit of measure uh, for volume of freight. So a 20-foot equivalent unit is a 20-foot container. Sometimes, every now and then, you don't see a lot of them, but every now and then you see a little short box on a, on a truck that's a 20-footer, and then you'll, you'll see the long one, which is a 40-footer, which is normally what you see. So um, a TEU is a is a is a 20 foot equivalent unit. Good question, though. Um, this is uh, this is actually a project that we're looking at into another uh, year, another uh, five to ten years before it's fully built out. We're building it out gradually based on demand. But today, this terminal is already handling uh, large post Panamax ships. Um, there's always uh, questions in the headlines whether the Port of Houston or whether other U.S. ports are ready for big ships coming in through the Panama, anticipated across through the Panama Canal. We are today handling those size ships from Europe. Um, they're not full, uh, but, uh, but they are the large ships. Our cranes can reach across the big ships, and our berth can receive those big uh, post Panamax ships. We still have some work to do in terms of the dredging uh, project in order to deepen it and, and prepare it for, um, for fully laden large ships, ships that are full. And um, what we've got now going on is that uh, we already have permits in place with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, who are responsible for the dredging work and getting the work done in order to deepen and widen, widen the channels. Um, today, the federal channel, the federal sponsored, uh, uh, the federally sponsored channel uh, for the Houston Ship Channel is already at 45 feet today, which can handle 10,000 TEU size ships, ships that can handle 10,000 of those 20 foot uh, containers. Um, that's really the size ship that's going to be able to cross through the Panama Canal um, in the future uh, when that project is completed. So the federal channel can handle it. But the small little inlet channels that go into these, this, this container terminal is only at 40 feet. So we need to dredge it an additional 5 feet to match the federal channel so that ships can come in through Galveston Bay, through the federal channel, and then cross into where the uh, Bayport container terminal is located in uh, Pasadena. Okay, so uh, we're going to do some dredging work. We've already got the permits in place, and we do have the funding already allocated in order to do that on our own. Normally, when a, uh, when, a, when a piece of cargo is imported, when something's imported into the United States, there's a small fee called a harbor maintenance fee, which is 0.0275% of the total invoice value. So let's say if you import tires from China, whenever you import those, those tires, you pay a, uh, a, a few percentage points uh, duty for that. And then you also pay a little surcharge called the harbor maintenance fee, which is a very small percentage of that invoice fee in order to maintain the harbors. Every U.S. import product pays that little harbor maintenance fee. Well, the Port of Houston is one of the largest um, uh, payees of that, payers of that harbor maintenance fee. We contribute uh, nearly uh, $200 million a year just for that harbor maintenance fee to the federal government. It goes to the federal government into a general fund. And then you chuckle because we chuckle too. You know, that's part of the challenge is that now getting that money back to maintain our harbors, that's a whole nother story. So we get on average uh, back about 15 cents on every dollar that we pay in. So we've got people going up to Washington DC every month can we please have our money back so we can do our work and be ready? Well, unfortunately, that falls on deaf ears. Um, 
there's other uh, <laughs> federal um, federal mandates that are in place, and there's smaller ports around the country that also need help to do their work as well. So there isn't enough to spread around around the country. So what we've done is we've opted to go ahead and fund it ourselves. We have to do this. We need to have that channel uh, deep enough right alongside of the terminal in order to, to accommodate these ships once they're ready to come in. So it's a it's a bit of a hefty price to pay. Um, uh, we don't see it being the right time to go out for bonds for this kind of a, of, of a, of a, a cost improvement uh, because of the environment. So uh, what we've done is the last uh, three, four years or so, we've taken some serious uh, cost cutting uh, measures uh, at the Port of Houston Authority and, uh, and based on our projections, our forecasted uh, revenue, uh, based on some of the cost cutting that's been taking place over the last few years, um, we're preparing ourselves in order to self-fund this project. This project here is going to cost uh, roughly $120 million and uh, we'll be uh, paying that out out of our own self-financed uh, operation, not waiting for the federal government. Um, our second container terminal is Barber's Cut. Barber's Cut's been around for nearly 40 years. Uh, this, this particular facility has rail connectivity in, across the country. Um, it also has a few post-Panamax uh, cranes, but now that a lot of that equipment is reaching the end of its life cycle, it's now undergoing a complete retrofit in order to accommodate uh, large ships as well. So uh, we've already got cranes on order that are going to be delivered uh, next year. These are huge, huge pieces of equipment. You can imagine uh, bringing in one of those cranes. Most of them are built overseas. They come in on uh, semi-submersible vessels at a very slow pace, and then they're installed by the manufacturer on the dock. So we need to uh, reconfigure the whole uh, uh, container yard and get it all prepared in order to have these bigger cranes that can handle these bigger ships. Um, the depth of this channel here is already at, uh, in some places, at 60 feet. So it's already very deep. Um, we've already got permits uh, in process right now to maintain it at 45 feet. We were fortunate enough that a couple years ago, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers needed some high quality grade clay to reinforce some uh, dredge placement uh, areas and they opted to dredge there, uh, which was good for us, so it's already deep. Now we just need to make sure that it's maintained at the right kind of level at 45 feet and that it's safe to go in. So we've got a little bit of work here to do, not as much as we've got to do ever at uh, Bayport at the, at the future uh, facility, but, um, but nonetheless we are uh, dredging. As you can see, uh, the, the larger size ship full uh, does require a little bit of additional, additional uh, depth and, uh, and naturally it's, it's a little bit wider so we need to widen, widen out the channel a little bit more to, to, to accommodate it, right? The crane reach and everything requires um, more space on the, uh, on the pad, on the container terminal itself. If we were to wait for the federal government to come in and cost share this, uh, we'd probably have that uh, channel dredged by the year 2025 based on what they've told us they can do for us. So, um, you know, these ships are coming in, the Panama Canal is expanding, uh, that project is anticipated to be completed by 2015, so we've gone ahead and opted to um, expand so that we're ready uh, to serve the region, serve the state. And, uh, and, and be ready for those big ships when they start coming in full. Break bulk terminals handle everything from grain, from agri to uh, large blowout preventers and uh, big pipe shipments and steel and all these things. We are the largest steel, uh, steel port in the country. We're also the largest break bulk port in the country. Break bulk is basically the term used for anything that cannot fit inside of a container. So we are the largest port in terms of project business and oil and gas business being really the driver behind that type of industry uh, in and out of the port. So we have a, a number of facilities that are specialized in different things, whether it's autos or pipe or steel, uh, we have different facilities to handle, handle those areas, right? One thing that we're really proud of, and it's sort of the same story for the state of Texas and for the whole region, is that um, we've, we've been consistently growing year by year over the last hundred years. Um, a lot of ports around the country in, in 2009, 2010, their volumes dropped by more than 20 percent. 
and uh, they had these catastrophic changes. Well, us in 2010, during the height of the crisis, our volumes dropped uh, about a few points and we ended up having just a little bit above a flat year. We had uh, less than uh, 20, uh, less than uh, one-fifth of one percent. So um, it, was, it was still a little bit of a flat year, but we didn't go down. So what we've been doing is gradually chipping away and, and growing every year, which is, which is really an exciting and a, and, a, and a good thing. Customers like that, shipping lines like that, because we're consistent. We're, we're really a port that they can count on the business always being there for the long run. Um, as far as our trade mix goes, our largest trading partner is actually Inter-Americas. When you combine our import flow and our export flow, there's more business coming in uh, through uh, from to and from Central America, the Caribbean, um, Brazil, uh, Argentina, the East Coast of South America, Venezuela, uh, the West Coast of South America, Chile, and all those countries. That's really where the large trading block is for us, just because of our geographic location. Um, in terms of our second largest, it's Europe. Uh, Europe uh, traditionally for the last hundred years has always been a strong area for us. Um, it's been, uh, we've, we've really had a large market share for the European business. Back about 10 years ago, Asia represented uh, less than 1% of our total business. Today, the last 10 years, it's actually our fastest growing trade block. Uh, Asia is by far the fastest growing trade that we see year by year. Uh, uh, with growth. Last year it outpaced all other regions at uh, all other uh, trade areas for us at 11 percent of our growth. It's really what's contributing to our strong growth uh, year by year is the Asian business. We've uh, been successful in attracting new steamship lines coming in from Asia. Um, with all the the, uh, the growth of the middle class and with uh, economies in Asia just really doing so well. Um, that's driving demand for energy products and agricultural products, things that the state of Texas is very good about uh, exporting. And uh, in terms of our population growth, that's really driving demand for Asian-made consumer goods. So the trade with Asia is by far the fastest growing. Um, I spend a lot of my time uh, in Asia. I go out there at least two, three times a year on for a couple weeks doing face-to-face -face meetings, trying to attract even more business and kind of build on it. And, and a lot of those sessions, whether it's the Asian business or the European business, that's where I'm always bumping into Danny, uh, where we're both trying to do the same thing, trying to attract business and make sure that when, when these companies that are out there uh, looking at the United States and places where they want to invest, yeah. we're trying to bring it here, trying to bring it home to Missouri City, to the city of Houston, trying to attract that business to this area because it's amazing how many delegations and how many companies and site selection consultants and, and, and real uh, commercial real estate folks are coming out here really eyeing our area because of the high technology, the energy sector, uh, the great pro-business environment, the great tax base, the, the way the real estate business is, is, is cost competitive but growing. It's a great investment area and really Asia, Asia uh, being uh, so capital rich at the moment, um, we're seeing a lot of growth in that sector right now. Um, just to kind of share with you a little bit of the kind of business that that we're doing across our docks. Um, actually, our, our number one import uh, customer using the Port of Houston is Walmart. Um, but, uh, but actually, our number one import commodity, because you know Walmart brings in everything, but really, if you look at a, one specific commodity, one specific uh, customer, it's actually Heineken. We import a lot of beer into the Port of Houston. We like our beer here in Houston and in Texas. You know. But uh, we do a lot, of, uh, a lot of machinery, a lot of steel and metal. Um, we do a lot of different types of uh, good, good mix of different commodities that come into the region. We also, um, in the outbound side, uh, no surprise, our biggest export commodity is chemicals. Chemicals and resins, uh, that's really where we're at. One thing that we're really trying to do and focus our energies on is to diversify out of some of our core commodities because when you have such a top heavy um, volume uh, that we're dependent on, you know, when the petrochemical industry sneezes, you know, we really suffer. So we're really working hard to try to diversify our mix of uh, customers, our mix of commodities, try to break into other areas so that we can be healthy and, and competitive in the long term. So 
but this kind of gives you an idea of, of where we're at today in terms of the types of products that come in and out of the port. Best story out of this entire presentation is that we're in the greatest place to do business. I mean, our location, it's just phenomenal. And, you know, the world is getting to understand that, you know. Uh, for a long time, we just didn't have that kind of market recognition. We don't have that, that glitz, you know, that Miami or New York or L.A. have. But honestly, the last five years or so, the last ten years, the whole state, uh, starting with our governor all the way down to our mayors, uh, we've all done a phenomenal job where Houston is really popping up on just everything, whether it's Bloomberg or U.S. News and World Report or Forbes. Uh, you go to international delegations, everyone's knowing about Houston. They're, they're feeling it when they're coming out here. They're feeling the energy. And it's really about our location because we're, we're centrally located. And when you look at, when you look at the logistics cost um, through rate for international trade, roughly 60% of the entire supply chain cost is actually domestic logistics. You know, it can cost you $1,000 to ship something from China to the U.S., but it'll cost you another 1000 to move it from the port to some inland place in the United States. It's just the nature of our own um, uh, internal logistics spend. Um, but uh, based on that, Houston is really the place because you can tap into your customer base on the West Coast or on the East Coast or up North. You can reach all types of markets. And when you combine that with our great foreign trade zone area, you can also hit other markets too, Caribbean, Latin America. So we're in a great location, not just for the United States, but for the entire continent. So now we're having uh, large companies from Brazil, like the largest steel manufacturer in Brazil, looking at Houston as a, as a, as a regional hub for them to bring their freight, their orders from, from China, from Europe, for Africa, you know, bringing it all in Houston because they, they know that from Houston, they could reach the world. You know, it's, it's a little hard for them to move products in and out of Brazil from all over the world, but if they're in a place like Houston, they could basically cover everything. So we've got companies in China, we've got companies in Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, um, well, Venezuela not so much lately, but we do have uh, different countries that are looking at us as really the place to be in terms of a, a logistics hub. And it's really about our location and the competitiveness of us reaching the entire U.S. market. Panama Canal expansion. It's a $5.2 billion project that was ratified by the Panamanian voters in 2006. And basically what it does is it builds a third set of locks that can accommodate the next generation of vessels that are coming online. Okay? The Panama Canal actually was, uh, was opened up the same year that the Houston Ship Channel was opened. Um, interesting footnote is that the Panama Canal um, uh, project was ratified by U.S. Congress in the same uh, piece of legislation as the Houston Ship Channel was. So we kind of share that, an that anniversary, we share uh, that, uh, that partnership, and actually we're very good friends. We're talking all the time, we're collaborating, and if you were to look at all the bios of the administrators and the, uh, and the, and the executive directors and the CEOs, of the Panama Canal Authority, uh, nearly all of them are educated right here in Texas. There's a lot of Aggies down there uh, with the Panama Canal Authority. Uh, the current executive director is a, is a graduate from Lamar University. Um, you know, these guys are really well trained in, uh, in, uh, in Texas and they, and they love Texas. But the Panama Canal Authority, basically what they're doing is they're expanding uh, the size of the Panama Canal to handle those bigger ships. Today, the largest size ship that can traverse the Panama Canal is a 4,400 TU ship, a ship that can handle 4,400 20-foot containers, the little short containers, or about 2,000 or so of the regular size 40-foot containers. When it's all said and done, the third set of locks, when it's, com when it's completed in the first half of 2015, will be able to handle ships that are nearly three times their size at 12,600 TUs very large ships. These ships, when you stand them up, if you were to stand them up, they'd be taller than the Empire State Building. They're almost twice the size of an aircraft carrier. They're huge, huge vessels. And, uh, and what that does is, really, the reason why these ships, ships keep getting bigger 
And that's not just something that's happening right now or that's been going on, it's a new trend. That's a trend that's been going on since the Phoenician days. Larger ships can carry more cargo at the same overall cost. So as there's a need to drive down, lower down freight costs and logistics, ships keep getting bigger with, with new technology. So when the Houston Ship Channel was dredged, when the Panama Canal uh, was first built, it was built in mind with the vessels of, uh, of the future, of 50 years ahead. Now, in order to keep up with the pace, everyone needs to do their work, whether it's the Port of Los Angeles, whether it's the Port of Norfolk, whether it's the Port of Miami, whether it's the Port of Houston, whether it's the Panama Canal, everybody needs to continuously prepare for larger ships because the ships just keep getting bigger and bigger year by year. So, so the Panama Canal is doing so in order to drive uh, lower cost per container, lower cost per unit on, uh, on, on international shipments from Asia and the West Coast coming into the United States, East Coast and Gulf. And, and we're doing the same thing, preparing for that same move. Now, what are the implications of that to us? Well, what that means is that actually our cost of international trade is going to decrease. It's going to lower. Um, the cost to move those 5,000 uh, baseball caps from China for you guys here at your golf club uh, are going to be, uh, it's going to be less. It's going to be less costly to move that freight in and out. It's going to be uh, less costly to move your exports and your business and your production from Texas that you want to reach customers out in China <coughs> with. It's going to be a little bit less expensive to do so. That in turn is going to drive demand for new distribution centers and new warehouses and things to handle imported goods. And that in turn is going to also drive the attraction of light manufacturing, heavy manufacturing in the area in order to reach those markets out overseas. So there's a lot of investment that's been going on on the East Coast. There's a lot of investment going on on the Gulf Coast. Um, all the different metropolitan areas, all the ports are doing the same thing that we are. Um, I'm very proud to say that we've got a great plan ahead of us. We've been ahead of the game in a lot of ways, and, uh, and we're prepared for these big ships. And what we're trying to do is market in the area the attraction of distribution centers and warehouses to the general area. At the end of the day, one of the reasons why we've been very successful is that companies like Walmart, Rooms to Go, um, companies like that have chosen Houston as their main area to open up uh, warehouses and distribution centers. The uh, 1.3 million square foot warehouse built by Rooms to Go out in Katy, that built in about 500 containers a week through the Port of Houston. That was new business that came through. When we uh, meet up with Exxon Mobil, or when we meet up with Walmart, or when we meet up with any of these delegations, the first question is, what are you guys doing to prepare for the Panama Canal? Because I need to be in a place that's going to be able to accommodate these larger ships. If you can't handle the larger ships, then I know I'm not going to get those cost savings once that thing is open. So when it is open, I want to take advantage of those lower cost, that lower cost component. So I want to make sure that your, your, your port's ready. So we've got all kinds of interests and a lot of companies are looking for that. And I think Missouri City is well positioned to attract some of these big box retailers. So when you think about economic development for the area, that's one sector that I think you should keep in mind. Um, transportation is is not a uh, it, it's not a it's not a low uh, low wage type of industry. It's actually supply chain has become uh, a very uh, a competitively paid uh, type of wage. Um, supply chain has now uh, grown in stature in terms of the industry. Um, the CEO of Walmart came from the supply chain side. A lot of people call Walmart actually a a supply chain company that does retail because that's really how they've been able to build their business model is uh, speed of goods to the shelves and, and, and being able to be very efficient in the way they move their goods. Um, Chicago, uh, Dallas has been very successful in attracting uh, distribution centers and industrial parks to, to uh, cater to big box retailers. We're trying to do the same thing here because we feel that we've got um, a great location um, when you look at uh, options versus places like Dallas, uh, we're really in a, in, a, in a unique place because we can offer importers two options. They can either bring stuff through the West Coast via rail or they can use uh, all water services too. Whereas a landlocked city, really you only have one option for bringing and transporting your freight. 
So that's really something. Even though I'd prefer all the freight to move all water, I realize that you got to give customers the options. So, so in Houston, we can give them those different alternatives. Um, a lot of this I've already stated. We're in a great place, and that's really what's driving a lot of the business. And what we do have uh, set up in our office, uh, we've, we've done some studies um, that really cater to the site selection consultant. Uh, we've, we have some area fact books, which I can share with you. I'll, I'll, I'll send you PDFs. I'll, I'll get something over to Stacy so she can distribute it to your team. But uh, we do have uh, uh, area fact books that actually uh, compare the greater Houston area, which encompasses Missouri City, with places like Dallas or uh, Los Angeles or uh, Savannah and compare us from a site selection uh, consultant's uh, sort of uh, perspective in terms of how we rank and how we score in terms of overall cost, location, demographics, uh, you know, even down to climate and you know, all the different 15, 16 factors that they use when they're trying to make a decision on opening a warehouse or opening up a DC or, or opening up a, uh, a location. Actually, you can use it for just about any kind of business and uh, I'll get that over to you. You can use it with your customers and prospective clients. But that's all I've got for you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to, happy to answer them. Yes, sir. I just have a brief question. You talked about containers. You talked about, I guess, the bulk materials. What about the oil and the gas? I mean, we've got a lot of refineries. I didn't see a percentage. Is that move basically up uh, Louisiana through the Mississippi, the petrochemical business? Uh, well, well, the uh, what you have up here is actually what's moving largely uh, by container. That's what I put up on the screen. But 90% uh, of our business is actually liquid bulk. Okay. And uh, most of that is moving either through pipeline, which doesn't impact uh, the Port of Houston in terms of the volume throughput, right. but it does get converted when it gets loaded onto tankers and moving out. Um, in terms of, uh, and, and about 90% of our overall tonnage is actually liquid bulk, uh, black, uh, black gold is oil. Um, in terms of uh, the overall oil and gas industry, the energy business, that's really the big driver for our steel, for our chemicals, uh, for all those kinds of things. Project cargo, break bulk cargo, because when you look at the machinery, and when you look at the equipment, when you look at the steel, most of that steel that we're doing is all um, oil country tubular goods. It's all pipe used for drilling rigs. Um, we, our volumes really go up and down based on the drilling rig count. Um, as offshore and onshore drilling rig counts go up and down, we see our, uh, our uh, uh, steel volumes going up and down because most of that steel is in pipes. Um, when we look at the uh, machinery and project cargo, almost all of that is all blowout preventers and uh, you know, other types of uh, high technology machinery, pumps, things like that, that are used in the oil, for oil and gas applications. But uh, to answer your question on the, on the liquid bulk side, um, that, uh, that is part of that. I didn't put it up there, but because it's really controlled by, you know, the Exxon Mobiles and the Shells, I mean, we don't really get too involved in it, but uh, that mainly moves in and out of tankers. And, and they're impacted too, because those tanker vessels are getting bigger just like all the other ships are. And, uh, and actually Exxon Mobil and Shell, they go with us to Capitol Hill and stuff when we're fighting to get the channel dredged because it impacts them, it impacts the consumer goods, it impacts Volkswagen who imports a lot of cars, uh, Volkswagen, Audi, Porsche, um, they bring in a lot of cars uh, through the Port of Houston. It impacts them, it impacts everybody. Gotcha. Thank you. Yes, sir. John? Yes, sir. Uh, I heard a presentation last year. Someone, I think, with the Port Authority, talking about the dredging uh, in the Panama Canal. And I think the comment was made because of stacking and as far as uh, how far out you'd have to go out into the Gulf, that uh, we probably won't get the big containers coming here first, that, that they may go to another port drop off what they have and then be able to come in. Is that, is that something that is going to happen or is that something you can foresee that we will be able to dredge far enough to get the big uh, ships in? 
That's a good question. I'm, I'm glad you you asked that because uh, there's um, there's a lot of uh, uh, folks out there that uh, share their opinions about how we sort of see the future evolving. Um, the largest size ship today that's been delivered and that's on order is a 17,000 TU size ship. Um, a 17,000 TU size ship is about 5,000 TUs larger than what the new uh, uh, locks in the Panama Canal is going to be ha uh, able to handle. Okay, there are probably uh, a dozen of those ships on order. They represent uh, less than three percent of the overall global fleet. Okay, um, so when we did a forecast out, when we look out and start looking at dredging projects and and, and, and what we need to do in order to prepare ourselves, we generally look about 15 years out, okay? And when we look at the population of uh, the city of Houston, the state of Texas, uh, when we forecast out our business, um, we see our, our volume, uh, where our volume is going to grow. Uh, we anticipate that the real workhorse for the Gulf and for the East Coast is going to be the 8,000 to 10,000 TU class ship. That's where, uh, that's our sweet spot. That's really where uh, nearly 85% of the, of the new orders are at, you know. Uh, when people are taking on, when carriers are taking on, uh, on a monthly basis, new ships, they're usually in that 8,000 TU class. There's, a, there's one or two companies that are taking on these huge ships, but those are mainly routed for, um, uh, Shanghai or, or, or Yantian to, to Rotterdam, uh, places like that. There's only really less than five ports, in the, five ports in the world that can handle that size of ship. Even the port of Los Angeles isn't prepared to handle that size of ship. And there's only one port on the East Coast that can handle that size of ship, that's the port of Norfolk, which has a, a really strong uh, deep water draft um, because of the, the naval base out there out in Hampton Roads. So, um, so really when we look out, uh, we really see our sweet spot being the 8,000, 10,000 uh, class vessel. That's where most of the vessels are, are there. And that's really the kind of vessel we kind of see our market accommodating. Um, just to kind of put things into perspective, the average size ship going into the west coast, into the port of LA Long Beach, is a 6,000 TU size ship. There's a couple every now and then that show up that are 9,000 or 10,000 in size. But the average size ship going in is actually, when you look at all their ships coming in and out, is about a 6,000 uh, TU size ship. So we're, what we're doing is we're going towards what we feel is going to be realistically the size ship that we're going to handle. If we were to dredge down an additional five feet, down to 50 feet, we'd have to dredge out uh, another 90 miles out into the continental shelf. The entire federal channel, Houston Ship Channel, would have to be dredged all the way out past Galveston into the continental shelf at a cost of more than $20 billion. And more than likely, we wouldn't see those big ships come here anyways, even if it was deep, because the market just doesn't support that class of ship. Because it's just, they're, they're just too big and there isn't enough of them. Uh, one day, perhaps 30 years from now, uh, we will have grown to that size where that size ship may be coming into the Port of Houston. But we'll probably leave that for that time to, to think about. Maybe when we have a little bit more money, you know, to do something like that. So the, the, the Panama Canal, the, the widening deep in the Panama Canal has to open up the, the logistics for the shippers to get, to get from, from the West Coast uh, shipping into the Gulf Coast with the larger ships uh, that you can do. And, and, that, and that's, that's sort of the beauty of it all. You're right here. You can send stuff out with your earlier slide there. Uh, yes. That's going to also trickle down to the other ports in the area as well. Uh, yeah, I guess there's going to be some other, uh, other ports that are going to benefit from it. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, the other ports in the area, unfortunately, just aren't prepared. Uh, they don't, either they, either they have the draft, like Port of Freeport is working on deep draft, but then they don't have the land side infrastructure. They don't have the cranes, they don't have the dock, they don't have the road, the, you know, the, the highways, they, they don't have the right kind of infrastructure on the land side to, to handle it. 
but, but then they've got specialized uh, niche areas that they can handle like LNG, for example. So special LNG uh, vessels uh, would be able to, large LNG vessels would be able to go into like the Port of Freeport, for example, and then hook up on, on, on pipeline network um, out of there. But, um, but really, when you think about the container business, there, isn't, there aren't many ports in the U.S. Gulf that can accommodate this kind of business. Um, as I mentioned, I handle, we handle uh, nearly 2 million uh, TUs, you know? Uh, we're your port, you know, I work for you guys, and, and our port can handle about one point, is handling 1.9 million TUs. Um, the nearest competitor to us, and, and we have 70% of the market share, the nearest competitor to us would probably be the port of New Orleans. They handle about 200,000 TUs. So it's just a, you know, from us it just drops to like, you know, way down. Uh, Portomobile, uh, Portomobile, they have uh, two cranes. We have uh, like 40 cranes, you know, uh, total. They've got like two cranes, uh, they've got, they're deep. Um, uh, they'll probably see a call, they'll probably see a vessel call going to Mobile um, after it comes into Houston because they, they do have a strong automotive sector, they've got some steel that they're doing, and that more than likely would be a port of the future. Um, Corpus Christi, uh, deep as well, but highly specialized, mainly for the offshore platform industry, uh, mainly for the um, wind tower components, things like that. But uh, but what shipping lines really look for is something where they've got a strong regional cargo base and they also have connectivity to the rest of the country and the infrastructure. And the thing is Houston just in and of itself just has so much cargo that it generates and that it attracts that it's a great place to be. Plus we can connect on to everyone else. So um, that's kind of where we compare it. But, uh, to answer your question, uh, there aren't a lot of ports that are ready to accept these big ships. There's a couple, like Port of Mobile. Um, it's questionable whether the Port of New Orleans will be able to handle it or not. They don't have the right equipment. They, they, they have a, a very uh, highly concentrated population right up against, pushed up against the, the docks, so they don't, have, they don't have room to kind of expand. Um, so uh, you'll probably see big ships coming through the Panama Canal, uh, maybe discharging or transshipping via the Panama, the port of Panama, uh, or Colon or Panama City, and then, uh, and then continuing on to Houston, uh, maybe making a stop in Mobile, Tampa perhaps, and then, and then back, to, back to Asia. Um, some, some carriers today uh, make stops in places like Kingston, or uh, Calcedo, Dominican Republic, and those are their hubs for transshipping cargo to different places. Um, we have some services that do that as well, but uh, we do have a, a number of services that, that come in directly from Asia straight to Houston and then just double back and go right back to Asia because we have enough cargo, we have enough business uh, for that steamship line to, to do that. Any other questions or? John, I understand that yes, uh, there are tours that you can go on if, the, if you want to learn more about Yes, the absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we can handle a tour for you uh, if you want to uh, get a group together or you have a visiting delegation. Danny knows as well, he really taps into that. But um, if you ever need anything like that, uh, we can do a tour of the facilities. Uh, we just had a group uh, yesterday of about uh, 15 executives from uh, large uh, users. Uh, we gave them a, an on-site tour and an overview. Uh, we could definitely do that. You know, we welcome that. Uh, that's what we're there for. Um, we can handle groups. You're more than welcome to come at any time. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it.